Brother Benny Liao is the editor of the Eastern Horizon. He was the editorial consultant and contributor to the Religions and Beliefs volume of the Encyclopedia of Malaysia. His writings have appeared in various local and international journals and publications, and Brother Benny has edited nine books on Buddhism. Benny holds a Bachelor of Arts Honours from the University of Science Malaysia and a Master's of Public Administration from the University of Malaysia. University of Malaya. So, over to you, Brother Benny. So, uh, thank you everybody for coming to today's session uh, organized by BGF. Okay. And of course, our speaker today is Dr. Tan Eng Kong, who has been a dear friend of BGF and also an active benefactor for many years. Uh, before COVID, he has actually never failed to offer his time to give a talk uh, to BGF during his annual visit to Malaysia to meet friends and relatives. We are therefore very pleased that we could meet Dr. Tan again today, even though not in person, but remotely throughout this online program. Just a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Tan, uh, for, for those of you who may not know him. Uh, Dr. Tan was the founder president of the Young Buddhist Association of Malaysia, way back in 1971. After migrating to Australia, he has had a distinguished career as a, as a, as a psychiatrist in Sydney. Uh, always a Buddhist at heart, he founded the Australian uh, Association of Buddhist Counselors and, Psycho and Psychotherapists and became its uh, first president. He was also the founding member of the University Buddhist Education Foundation of Australia and the academic board member and adjunct professor at Nantian uh, Institute in Wollongong, Australia. Dr. Tan today will be speaking on the topic of wisdom in the time of pandemic. He will touch on both Buddhist understanding of wisdom and that of, psycho, of, the, of psychology, particularly of neuroscience. We are indeed therefore uh, very happy uh, that, uh, that this is a very uh, timely topic in a, in a present difficult and unprecedented time because no one really knows when this COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic will be gone. So Dr. Tan's explanation on how to understand wisdom and to practice compassion at, at such a time of COVID will be most timely. Dr. Tan will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes and after that we'll have a Q&A session and we should end our session at 11.30. So let me now invite Dr. Tan to share with him, to share with all of us here, his, uh, his talk this morning. Dr. Tan, please, over to you. Thank you, Benny. And thank you, uh, Benny and Bobby and BGF for inviting me to speak uh, on this auspicious day, Father's Day. Mm. Happy Father's Day to everyone. Um, reminds me of uh, the, the Buddha, often is, is a fatherly figure for all of us in uh, our spiritual journey, yeah. And uh, thank you, Bobby, for uh, allowing me to choose the topic for this morning's uh, presentation. And as uh, Benny alluded to, I thought it would be timely to say something in this pandemic period. And uh, in Sydney, uh, we've had a lot of talks on compassion with regards to this pandemic period and also in the international uh, speakers over this pandemic period from all over the world, uh, compassion has been emphasized a lot, understandably, for this pandemic period. But uh, we're just beginning to have a series of talks in Sydney, Australia and I think the rest of the world too, there's now bringing up wisdom, um, which is the other wing of the butterfly um, for our considerations in this, as Benny says, very uncertain period, yeah? So I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning. And in particular, welcome to the five Buddhist organizations um, who are coming through via the Facebook posting. So good to have all of you. Um, I must say at the outset that uh, it is also your wisdom to choose to be with all of us this morning. Eh? 
So all of us have uh, uh, various aspects and amounts of wisdom. But in our spiritual journey, of course, we, we hopefully continue to acquire more wisdom. And in this talk today, um, I will also be inviting uh, Benny uh, Mian, psychologist Mian, and psychiatrist uh, Dr. Chinka to join me, especially during the Q&A time, to, to share their wisdom and to contribute uh, to this meeting as well. So on to the first slide, which uh, Alex will put us to. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. The next slide. So what is wisdom? We can look up the dictionary or look up the Wikipedia. One of the things to clarify first, I suppose, is, is to say there are clearly two types. The theoretical one, which is understanding the very deep nature of reality. Now that brings us straight away from the Buddhist, from the spiritual world, the transcendental wisdom, which is actually intuitive. So when I told some of my colleagues that I'm going to be speaking on wisdom, some of them say to me, Eng Kong, how, how can you talk on something that is ineffable, that is intuitive, that is transcendental? Well, I think thanks to uh, a lot of the teachings from the Buddha, in, in that sense, every teaching from the Buddha is wisdom-based. Huh? They are all very wise teachings, aren't they? Um, and thanks to modern neuroscientific studies, we can actually bring in the theory of wisdom in a scientific way as well. But what all of us very much want in this pandemic period is the practical aspect of wisdom. Huh? How, how do we make decisions in this very difficult time of our life, in this uh, unprecedented time for the whole world? Each of us as individuals have, have to make very difficult decisions. Uh, each country has to make difficult decisions for its subjects and so on. And it is about, practical wisdom is about doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. And I must say, when I read that uh, from Wikipedia, right thing, right time, right reasons, I think it, it is also using the word right from the A4 path. Right, of course, means not wrong, but it is also skillful. Eh? It is the skillful thing, the skillful time, and the skillful reasons, because often there is no right or wrong in uncertain times to have to make decisions. But we would all agree that wisdom is a product of age and experience. Now today, thanks to lots of studies with MRI scan and so on, uh, we actually can localize different parts of the brain for different components of wisdom, which I'll share briefly later in this talk. Huh? Next slide. So when we ask around, um, who are the wise people we know and what do we mean by wise people? I think we are straight away talking about someone who's warm-hearted, compassionate, so has to be open-minded and open-hearted. And straight away for many of us, Mother Teresa comes to mind, eh? apart from the Buddha. Mm -hmm. Wise people are also self-reflective and empathic. They're excellent, good listeners. And they are regular meditators. And here, Mahama Gandhi comes to my mind. Gandhi meditated every day. And Gandhi was an excellent listener. He listened to the whole of India. And in his regular meditations, he reflected well, and he could empathically sway the whole country 
towards a good direction. Wise people do what is right, what is skillful, arising from their beliefs, their convictions. And of course, as Buddhists, our Eightfold Path. Now, in terms of um, the world at large, without necessarily bringing in spirituality, the person that comes to mind for me in terms of doing what is right is Confucius. Confucius, he has a lot of written material on, on what is right to be as a father on this Father's Day. What is right being a mother? What is right being uh, uh, the children of parents? What is right to be in the government? What is right to be a citizen? Mm -hmm. Confucius was very wise and, and we can learn a lot from his rightness. Wise people can remain calm and still and resolute in the midst of uncertainty and chaos. Now, this is particularly relevant for us in this pandemic time. And uh, bringing in from the world of psychology, uh, when I was a medical student, uh, IQ was where we all um, emphasized. We then realized, uh, thanks to Daniel Goleman, publication on his book on emotional intelligence, we realized that the, our emotional quotient, which is to recognize understand and manage our emotions and therefore influence others is even more important. So the going, the saying goes, IQ gets you your job, but EQ gets you your promotions. More recently, the spiritual quotient is talked about in the general public. So spiritual quotient refers to our ability to be aware, to be insightful, and to be creative. That's how our spirituality helps us. But most recently, we now have developed, and I'll go into it a bit more later, a wisdom quotient. Now the wisdom quotient actually adds IQ to EQ and adds SQ. And when the more I study, the more I read about it and hear about it, it actually leans on the moral and ethical values. And therefore it's very similar to our spiritual journey. And I'm not surprised wisdom and compassion are closely linked. And even in the questionnaires in the wisdom scale, there are questions on wisdom and compassion. So the next slide brings us to what we all know very well, but just to go through, I'm sure all of you, uh, this is a repetition. Uh, from the world, from our religion, hmm? uh, Panna in Pali and in Sanskrit, Prachna, the perceiving of the true nature of reality, intimately experienced beyond conceptual knowledge. So again, this is intuitive insight. And if I may take a moment here, from the world of uh, Mahayana Buddhism, the Prajna Paramita, the perfection of wisdom, the emphasis there is the direct experience of shunyata, emptiness. So in that sense, wisdom in the Mahayana tradition takes a central position. Eh? Of course, it's wisdom and compassion because of the Bodhisattva emphasis as well. In the context of meditation and speaking as a fellow meditator, we all experience anicca, dukkha, 
an anatta during our meditation. So this first-hand experience helps us to understand the basic three characteristics of our existence. And we gain a lot of wisdom by understanding these three truths. And of course, in a practical way, the Eightfold Path, the first division, very often, the first part, wisdom, um, is about our right understanding and right view of things as they are. And of course, our right intentions, right thought, is based on love, selflessness, non-violence to all beings. So even at the start of this uh, Zoom group together, we can ask ourselves, uh, what is the view I'm bringing in into this meeting? And what are my intentions? What do I hope to gain? Uh, what do I hope to share? Uh, what might I benefit from this webinar? What are my right intentions for this morning? Next slide. And the next. From the world of psychology, we now have these five aspects about wisdom that's been researched and studied. And not surprisingly, uh, compassion and empathy. And secondly, emotional stability. I'm going to have a slide on each of these five headings shortly to elaborate. But on an overview, um, the world of psychology now in helping all the clients, all the patients as professional psychologists, psychiatrists, members of the helping profession, there's so many skills and techniques just to help emotional regulation. And in this pandemic period, we're all in the balancing act because we have to accept uncertainty. And of course, the central contribution from the world of psychology, the world of psychiatry, is ultimately our self-reflection, our self-understanding. The Buddha has done us the favor of doing it upon himself, sitting under the Bodhi tree, Sigmund Freud has done it through his dreams and the interpretation of his dreams. But each of us have to do it for ourselves in this part of wisdom. And finally, the, the, the whole society in making decisions based on our practical aspects of our life. Next slide. Thank you, Alex. I thought I would share those four very meaningful faces of the Dalai Lama with all of you. To take a break, to even just receive from the Dalai Lama how well he radiates the Brahma Viharas. So, on to the first component from the world of psychology on uh, wisdom, which is about compassion and empathy. It is towards our attitudes and behaviors that helps the society around us. So it's fundamentally altruistic. Um, we can all gain a lot, even if we um, search on the YouTube, lots of YouTube um, recordings on the word kindness and random acts of kindness. Uh, this would be a good time for us to volunteer. Hmm? For instance, uh, we, we could volunteer to assist in uh, vaccinations today, hmm? to give time to be present to help others. 
And with regards giving and receiving lessons in life, which is to cultivate some more compassion and empathy, this life skills within ourselves. One obvious way would be, if you haven't already done so, uh, is to join the counseling courses that, that BGF offers. Because as a counselor, as a therapist myself, as I study, as I learn some more counseling, some more therapeutic skills and techniques, um, I am receiving and giving lessons in life in a very active way, beneficial to me and others. And of course, to use the Buddhist word, yeah, paramitas, our virtues, patience, generosity, morality, vigor, concentration, and wisdom. And very interestingly, when Martin Sagman, the former president of the American Psychological Association, when Martin Seligman researched happiness and what are the factors that increases the happiness index, and he was the one who influenced nowadays happiness conferences all over the world. When he came to it, the basic foundations of it, he realized that it was about virtues and the cultivation of virtues. And his virtue list very similarly is about humanity, justice, temperance, spirituality, wisdom, and courage. And very interestingly, from the Bible, the seven virtues from the Bible, faith, hope, charity, fortitude, justice, temperance, prudence, and self-restraint. Martin Seligman's The Bibles, so similar to our Paramitas. Next slide. I'd like to show and share this slide because there's a lot of literature and a lot of practice of compassion but I want to emphasize here self-compassion. We actually have to learn how to give it to ourselves. We're quite good at giving it to others. I'm sure in, in this audience, in this group this morning. Yeah? But thanks to the Buddha, when we cultivate the Brahma Viharas, step one, to give it to ourselves first. Second slide. It comes natural to us. We are born with this capacity of a loving kindness for others. So as the Buddha says, it is just cultivating what we already are, the Buddha within us. Next. The second component of wisdom from the world of psychology very strongly today in this world that so many people traumatize in different ways. It's about emotional stability. And thanks to Professor Martin Seligman and others, uh, Barbara Fredrickson, who's written a book just entitled Positivity. It is, it is being with positivity and peace from the spiritual traditions that we gain more and more emotional stability. And emotional stability, you will agree with me, is vital for each of us in this pandemic period. I'm reminded of a lovely saying from uh, Thich Nhat Han with the boat people as they arrived. He said, on the boat, all of us are frightened. All of us get into panic. But if, if one of us can remain mindful, calm, stable, the rest of us are safe on the boat. And it is sustained in this pandemic period today. So self-regulation is of utmost importance. 
is part of our resilience, of course. And when we find support, we give support to others, when we are connected to our community, our Sangha. This connection that I have right now with all of you and all of us being connected together contributes to our stability as well. To be able to practice optimism, that's very important. And not to take things personally, not to take things so personally. Yeah, mistakes occur in life. We all make mistakes. Shit happens. <laughs> now the big shit is the virus. <laughs> um, and also to remember, no mud, no lotus. Even our personal life, our personal stresses, our personal unhappiness, they are all the mud from which we can learn. So the next slide brings us to the third component, balancing our decisiveness as we accept that this is a time of uncertainty. So we can only work with what we've got and what we know. We have to accept what we don't know. We don't know how long this pandemic will last. We don't know when the next pandemic will come around although we're quite sure there will be some more pandemics, unfortunately. But let's work with what we've got, what we know. And in our brain, we're already born as sentient beings with a brain, with a cortex that we can use. And later on, I'll go into the details from pictures from the brain as well. Our limbic system and our cortex, our prefrontal cortex, PFC, which is at the executive center of our brain. Mm -hmm. Very importantly, we are all the time balancing between what is immediately rewarding, but keeping in mind, very important, the long-term reward. So I've received my first vaccination, not just to protect myself, but it is the long-term reward. I'm also contributing to the feedback to researchers about the AstraZeneca vaccination I've received eh? and the long-term reward to the community as for me in Sydney, Australia, eh, we're approaching a higher, higher percentage of people being vaccinated, which is good for the whole of Australia, which is only one big island in the whole world. Hmm? We are also at a time of many serious moral dilemmas. We have to apply our critical thinking and to remember non-judgmentally with humility to accept such a diversity of views. I even have medical colleagues from some of their points of view still arguing that they should not receive the virus, that they should not receive the vaccination. So in this difficult period, many people in the front line also has the moral dilemma, who, when to treat first, who, when um, to save first, in a very difficult emergency room. And we know that the different parts of the brain, there's a part of the brain that takes care of urgent decisions that has to be made now. And there are other parts of the brain that we can take our time to make a decision. And we all know, in a sense, good decisions comes from learning from experience of bad decisions. And in that sense, it's not actually good or bad. It is actually, we make a decision as best as we can, and we learn from the consequences of the decision, and we make a better decision the next time. Next slide. Here we are balancing and still having to decide as an individual. The next slide 
on the fourth component, reflection and self-understanding, which is the cornerstone of our meditations, whether it's a few seconds reflecting, whether it's hour upon hour reflecting when we're in a retreat, to understand, understand ourselves better, our mind, our strengths, our limitations. From way back, philosophers, including Plato says, the unexamined life is not worth living. And when I help my patients in meditative psychotherapy, we often end a session, a 15 minute session with a meditation. And at the end of the meditation to repeat the self affirmations. And the self affirmations are a very necessary antidote to the negativity that all of us have. Was the Brahma Viharas, I asked each of my patients towards the end of the session, of the four immeasurables, which one shall we meditate now in our last five minutes that will attend to the material that has come up in this session and that will help us best integrate ourselves together as we complete this session. And one of the four is the antidote, as you know, to the near and far enemies of the Brahma Viharas. So we have to keep an open mind, to be curious, to review our positiveness, our accomplishments, which gives us our affirmations. And not to forget to be lighthearted as well, eh? to have a sense of humor. One of the comedians said, life is like a game of chess, but I do not know how to play chess. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, I'm still learning how to play chess. And someone just reminded me that at the end of a chess game, don't forget, the king and the pawn ends up in the same box in life, the coffin box, and so on. Eh? So, another one with a bit of humor. Knowledge is like underwear. It's useful to have it, but it's not necessary to show it off. <laughs> I hope I'm not showing off, uh, I hope I'm just sharing, but just not knowledge, but experience and uh, uh, whatever that can be shared in our giving and receiving together. I've often thought that life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer it gets to the end, the faster it rolls. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all the old, old fathers. <laughs> so now let's move on to something more serious, um, to neuroscience. And the next slide, which is contributed by Chinka, by Dr. Bang Chinka, brings us to the brain. I just want to point out on the left-hand side, the view of the whole brain, uh, the, the cortex, uh, the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex and the orbitofrontal cortex, which is behind the eyes, our eyes, the orbitofrontal cortex. These three areas, which I'll refer to in the next slide. The wisdom lies in these three areas. And we, when we cut the brain into half, this is the half view. Again, that's the prefrontal cortex and that's the orbitofrontal cortex. The next area I like to call your attention to is this green area, the cingulate gyrus. And the next slide. On the neuroscience, we know that wisdom is hardwired into our brains. So in terms of the prefrontal cortex, is the executive center. That's where we do our reflecting, our self-understanding. Regular meditators, the monks who meditate in the caves for years, 
they have a very thick and enlarged prefrontal cortex. It is also the seat of our pro-social activities, which depends on our highly developed empathy and compassion. Now in the cross section of the brain, the cingulate, the iris, remember the green area? That's where our awareness lies and where we learn and where we can gather, have, make social decisions. And it is also in the cingulate gyrus, the dorsal part, where we can exercise and keep improving our emotional regulation, our balance. Ultimately, in Buddhist terminology, our equanimity and to keep increasing our storehouse of equanimity. That's in the singular gyrus. Our decisiveness is also from the cortex area. Next slide, please. So as we come to the conclusion, I'd like to share with you how you can measure your wisdom score, if you like. You can just Google the San Diego Wisdom Scale by Dr. Jest, J-E-S-T-E. -E. You will find a 28 item questionnaire and within five to 10 minutes, you can score yourself on these six sub scales, which is the areas we've covered in this talk on your capacity to contribute through your behavior to society, how well you're regulating your emotions nowadays, what's your depth of self-reflection, how well we accept uncertainty from the Buddhist point of view, uh, change, 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 anicca, anicca, anicca. Your decisiveness, especially in this pandemic time, and of course, in our joint social decision-making. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised how wise you already are. <coughs> and the next slide is an area that we can meditate on. Next slide, please. Yes. We all want to become wiser, faster, quicker, especially in this time of need for our wisdom, this pandemic time. If we now, even with open eyes or closed eyes, as you like, reflect upon how well do I reflect upon myself? How capable am I in my openness to new experiences. The Dalai Lama says, every year, go somewhere new. Meet new people all the time. How well am I cultivating and improving my level of empathy and compassion? Am I being mindful with myself? hopefully most of the time? Am I mindful of you now and all of us in this Zoom period, including being mindful of the time and I should be concluding soon? And how am I regulating my emotions so far and the remainder of this session as well? Where am I in my spirituality journey? as I humbly subscribe to the transcendental powers above. And in my contribution to humanity, through my spirituality, and at a very practical level, becoming wiser includes, I still visit the gym three times a week to exercise. I keep an eye on what I eat, what I drink, I make sure every night, average eight hours of sleep. And of course, today, washing hands regularly, keeping social distance, hygiene, 
Yeah. It's all part of being wise for ourselves and for others. So, in conclusion, the next slide for those interested. This is the book you might want to have a look at by Dr. Jest. And you can also um, go into the TED Talks and the YouTubes. You just click Wisdom and his name, Dilip Jess, and you can enjoy him talking about wisdom from his research point of view. Um, and notice his title of his book, The Scientific Roots of Wisdom, Compassion, and What Makes Us Good. What makes us good for ourselves, what makes us good for others. And uh, Dr. Jess is a Hindu, and he talks about from the age of eight, he was already reading the Bhagavad Gita. And as we know, the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of God, a lot of the teachings from Bhagavad Gita are so similar to Buddhism. In the Bhagavad Gita, it talks about the enemies of the wise man. The enemies of the wise man is anger and desire just like the Buddha talks about, yeah, hatred and uh, desire, and of course, delusions as the three poisons. Yeah? And by this, wisdom can conquer anger and desire from the Bhagavad Gita. And from Buddhism, the extension is to equanimity as an essential virtue. Thank you all for listening to me for the last 35, 40 minutes. I now hand you over to Benny and I really look forward to a lot of discussions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Tan. I think that was a very insightful overview of wisdom uh, in the context of uh, the pandemic that we are currently experiencing. And, and I think you have uh, touched on some very pertinent points which uh, if most of the participants, if they have been uh, studying or practicing Buddhism, they will they'll, they'll realize the importance, uh, you, you, you reminded us, the importance of practicing the four uh, Brahma Viharas or the four sublime states, which you have uh, so uh, nicely used the photo of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, to encapsulate each of the four uh, sublime states of uh, loving kindness, of compassion, uh, of, equi uh, of, of sympathetic joy and also of equanimity, all right? I think you have also touched on uh, five very important, uh, what you call components of wisdom, uh, which you mentioned in, say, in psychology, all right? And obviously one of the key elements you mentioned there is about compassion and empathy. And like uh, all of us know the, the importance of, uh, in Buddhist practice, uh, it's not just wisdom, but it's al always wisdom and compassion. And, and I think those, and, and also you, you, you elaborated uh, very nicely the five aspects. And for those who are familiar with the, the mindfulness uh, practices, I think it reminds me particularly of what we are familiar with called the RAIN, R-A-I-N, the, 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 the RAIN formula, all right, where first you need to recognize the nature of existence, which you touched on in the earlier part, and then to, to, uh, to accept all right, the acceptance part, which you mentioned as, uh, I think, the third component. And then the investigation, what we can do, the reflection com 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 component, which you also have touched on. And finally, the non-identification. All right, the, don't take things too personally. All right, after all, we are all interrelated. All right? Instead of asking, why me? Why not? Okay, so I think that, I think for, for those of us who are familiar with uh, uh, mindfulness practices, so this, uh, this four uh, keywords of RAIN, of, uh, of recognizing, of accepting, of investigating, and non-acceptance, I think becomes so, so, uh, so appropriate, so, so, so relevant to what you, you have mentioned. Okay, so thank you very much. I think that was a great, uh, great exposition in, in, in many ways. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Tan again, and thank you, Benny again. And Dr. Pang and uh, Mian. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone. And thank you for all the questions and the discussions as well. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Voice. Very nice to follow your work. Thank you, Sadhu.